is uh, it's about cancel culture. This comes from a Chris Hedges article. Uh, if you're familiar with Chris Hedges, uh, don't don't expect for hope. <laughs> Chris Chris Hedges is one of those people where I I read him to understand the source of the problem more than I do to find um, an avenue for a solution. Um, I mean, he does talk about solutions, uh, but not. But what he's very, 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 very good at is uh, is uh, really identifying the the sources of uh, of the problem here. Uh, so, what he starts out with talking about is is a very interesting story. And I didn't I didn't know about this gentleman until Hedges pointed it out. A gentleman by the name of Will Campbell. Now, Will Campbell was a um, white Baptist preacher in the South. Uh, he marched with MLK. He was uh, one of the people that escorted black kids uh, when schools were desegregated in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, that got him a lot of negative attention uh, from from you know typical white Southerners that that were fine with separate but equal. That were fine with uh, black people having their own. Uh, you know, their own school versus white schools kind of thing. And and that sort of segregation still exists today, by the way. It's just not as blatant as it was. Um, it, you know, there, there are predominantly more black schools than there are white schools in certain, in certain instances, like my high school for, for a majority of my high school years, I was the minority. Uh, we had maybe one or two black kids in all four grades when I went to, when I went to high school, um, you know, so it, that sort of stuff still does exist, but this Will, Cam Will Campbell guy he was a white Baptist preacher. He led these kids and, and provided them safe passage through the schools in Little Rock, uh, which was huge. He was a big friend to John Lewis and here's the twist. He was pro Klansman. Now he, this is the distinction, right? The distinction is, that he is anti Ku Klux Klan. He's anti KKK. He's anti the ideologies that this organization stands for. But he was he was part of the Klan when all this stuff happened, right? He was he was a white Baptist preacher that was in the Klan, but helping out black people, marching with MLK, and talking to him, um, you know, about the issues within within the community that leads people to the Klan. So that's what he focused on. His focus was on, uh, you know, at, at a certain time, he probably had some enlightenment, uh, probably be before he marched with MLK and all, and so on and so forth. And he realized, well, why are people joining an organization like the Klan? And in the 50s and 60s, particularly, the Klan was trying to get new members. And I uh, remember reading about this. Uh, first of all, by the way, I, I do I, I have a stand-up clip where I talk about this, but uh, we've had Klansmen as the governor of certain states. Like Indiana had a had a uh, a Klansman as its governor for a while, and you know people were fine with it. People were a okay with this guy being part of the KKK, uh, espousing the same um, espousing the same kind of philosophy as the KKK. Uh, and they were totally cool with it. Where they drew, drew the line was uh, him using his gubernatorial powers to get Klansmen out of prison and and essentially pardoning them to get them out of prison. And they're like, uh oh, now you're using, you know, this is this is nepotism. This is nefarious. They didn't have a problem with the ideology. They just had a problem with him, you know, uh, using those ideologies as a way to get Klansmen out of prison. And it wasn't even the fact that they were Klansmen coming out of prison. It's just that uh, it's it's political corruption. They were like, "Oh, you're too corrupt. Even the Klan can be corrupt. Who knew?" <laughs> um, but uh, he he spoke in Michigan. He spoke in Michigan, right? The, the, these kids, uh, the, this college invited him and uh, to speak because uh, everybody kind of knew that he was he was somebody that was close with John Lewis, close with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And they played this CBS, excuse me, a CBS documentary 
that talked about the uh, the Ku Klux Klan, and it talked about you know um, the domestic violence that the Ku Klux Klan has committed, and boy howdy, uh, have they committed a lot of uh, domestic violence. Fun fact about the Republican Party, though, is that in the beginning, uh, uh, when the Republican Party was formed, they took such a great anti stand anti clan stance um, that they would go out, and when they would find out that uh, the the KKK was you know terrorizing towns because there were freed black people there uh they the republican party actively would go out and physically fucking fight the clan so the origins of the republican party which you know in 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 the 20 20th and 21st century you could say becomes the party of uh of the clan uh was were hunting them they became like super clan hunters is basically what they were, right? Back to Will Campbell. Sorry, that was a little side. Will Campbell basically talks about how what we need to do is understand why somebody would join something like the KKK. And there are economic forces at play here because what the clan says is, uh, well, you know, you're you're a poor white person that has all these opportunities taken away from them. You know, you lost your job. You've, uh, you, you've, you've, you've moved down in status and that's all because of black people and brown people and immigrants and women and th this minority group and that minority group. And these people are coming in and they're gaining more. Um, they're, they're, they're getting more of, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the rights that, uh, belong to you and the way they kind of present it is um you know these these bad things that are happening are not happening because of capitalism and the way capitalism works and the way capitalism essentially fucks over um the working class but it's happening because of these people that you're supposed to hate so basically what the clan was doing and what um what a lot of these sort of uh, nationalistic groups do is that they take the anger that these people have and they misdirect it to various different minority groups. So Will Campbell was explaining that to these to these uh, college kids and a bunch of them left. A bunch of them started calling him a racist. A bunch of them started saying that he was a fascist. And they effectively tried to cancel him. They They tried to cancel somebody that was looking at the economic forces behind something that leads people into groups like the Ku Klux Klan. And in that speech, he said, I'm pro-Klansman, I am anti-KKK. The person, the human being that is part of this organization is part of this organization because their anger has been manipulated and misdirected and their fears have been shifted onto a different person. And I mean, we see this all the time now. What do we want to do with the people that rioted at the Capitol on January 6th? And again, this is not a this is not me being like, well, let them go. No, what they did warrants something um to be done, right? They 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 committed an act of uh, treason for all intents and purposes. They they tried to have a violent coup. But if you want to prevent stuff like that from happening, what are the forces in play that cause those people to follow somebody like Donald Trump, listen to, to, to him like he was some kind of golden god, and then eventually, as things escalated over the course of four years, led them to the steps of the Capitol with guns, pushing their way in, stealing, you know, fucking Nancy Pelosi's podium and what have you well first of all when the investigation was done uh, a lot of these people were in in financial destitution they were not doing well financially right uh, they were hurting 60 uh, percent of them are actually going bankrupt that's a lot 60 percent of the people that it, 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 
listen, sixty percent of the people that attacked the Capitol are going bankrupt. Had have had crazy debts that they couldn't pay off. Have been sued by debt collection services because they can't pay off their 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 debts to certain things. I mean, how many times do we see that in our society where, you know, it's like, oh, man, I can't afford all of my car payments because of this economic impact that happened in my life. And the banks go, well, OK, you have this amount of time to do it. And you go, all right, well, I don't know if that's going to be what it what's going on. I'm not, I'm not I don't know if I can it, within that time be able to do it. And then the banks go, OK, well, you're going to have a debt collection service and then you still can't pay it off. But. Then they want to repossess your car and you go, well, whatever little payments I am making, I require my car to make it because my car is what gets me to work. And then you're just angry and you're stewing and and you have this window of opportunity to go, well, it is the system that is creating this problem. And instead of looking at that, they go, it's brown people, it's black people. It's the LGBTQ community, it's women, it's immigrants, it's refugees. And that's an easy way to do it. But the economic forces are the ones that cause you to kind of come to this crossroads and make you easily manipulated. Ma manipulated. When you're in a state of high emotional duress, it is easy for you to get manipulated. That, that's how gaslighters um, kind of take advantage of people, right? The, the, they, they find ways to frustrate you. And then they manipulate you and lead you down this path. That's how gaslighting works. No different here. Uh, they kind of pitch to you the idea that rights and, and, and wages are limited resources, despite that not really being the case, right? I mean, rights are, they're kind of made up. So why, why wouldn't you, <laughs> we have the infinite amount of rights. There's no limits on if I have the right to free speech doesn't mean that Earl down the street has the, no longer does because I do these live streams every day. Earl can't express his express his opinions and his peace of mind or what have you. That's not the way that it works, but that's how they're pitched. And because they're in a state of emotional duress, it's easy for them to be manipulated in that direction. Will Campbell knew that because Will Campbell came from that culture. Right. He came from the rural culture. His parents were were people that were that that lost their jobs to because the factory moved to Mexico or because, you know, hey, you know what we figured out? The, the corporation wants to hire more immigrants because immigrants don't ask for a minimum wage. They'll take whatever the fuck they can get. That's an economic force. So to understand that, you, you can't understand that if you just cancel a group of people and say, fuck it, your opinions, your life, your, your, what you've been through don't, doesn't matter anymore. That's just going to cycle them back into you know, the KKK and the white nationalists and so on and so forth and then, root, and then dig them further into that extremism rather than pull them out and go, yeah, okay, I think I fucked up. I went the wrong direction. Will Campbell understood that right. There's another guy. Uh, he, he's a, 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 a black jazz musician by the name of Daryl Davis, I believe. He was just back on the Jimmy Dore show. I, I've, I've known about Daryl Davis for quite some time. Um, he did a couple TED Talks and a couple uh, kind of mini documentaries on YouTube, I think. Um, and he went and talked to Klansmen. Grand, Grand Dragons, the, the leaders of, which is just such a fucking silly title for a leader it, the grand like it's just so silly to me but uh anyway when he talked to them he had one-on-one -on -one meetings and in the ted talk he describes like okay i knew what i was doing daryl daryl davis thank you uh i just saw that comment pop up from holly but uh daryl davis in the ted talk he said i took a bodyguard with me to meet at this hotel where we would both have to check in we would both have to put our names in so if something happened to him, there's a traceable record, right? Because even he was unsure about what was going to happen. And that sort of cautious trepidation is absolutely warranted. And he went in and eventually once the tension broke, right, they were able to talk to each other face to face. 
And this guy, this this Grand Dragon started realizing that a lot of the same concerns that the members of, of the KKK have are the same concerns that people in the black community have. So why are they fighting? Eventually, uh, and, and this took years because he and Daryl Davis would just keep going back and talking to them over and over again. Eventually, that Grand Dragon gave up the robe. And he gave it to Daryl Davis. That's one dude. Right? Will Campbell, one man. That's trying to show you the economic impacts of, uh, uh, of what leads people to extremist ideologies. And Daryl Davis is the opposite side of that coin that, un that understood what the economic forces that lead people to extreme ideologies are and pull them out of the extreme ideology to focus on the economic fucking impact. Imagine how effective we would be against racist, nationalistic, and extreme ideologies if all of us were able to do that. And this is a two-way street because that Grand Dragon had to accept the meeting from Daryl Davis, the black musician. Will Campbell had to have some self-reflection in order to realize, wait a minute, I don't really believe in the racist ideologies of the Klan, but I do understand the economic impacts that these folks are talking about. Where, where's the, wh why was I, you know, driven down to racial hatred? That self-reflection needs to also happen. That acceptance that I'm going to accept the olive branch from somebody that I perceive as my enemy also has to happen. It's a two-way street. If if I go out and say, I want to talk to a bunch of fucking uh, MAGA folks about why they voted for Trump, and I come at them with insults, they're not going to want to talk to me. But if I come at them and I say, hey, I'm curious about why you voted for Donald Trump. And they go, well, fuck you. You're, you know, you immigrant piece of shit, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, the, the conversation's over. You didn't reciprocate. So you don't, you, you know, you're not trying to understand. You don't have empathy. You are what people say you are. You're a callous, closed off, you know, ignorant individual. And that sucks because I'm trying to understand where you're coming from. And hopefully you'll understand where I'm coming from. And we can have a little bit of common ground, have a little bit of, uh, you know, we can see that we might be on the same team. In reality, a lot of these folks are on the same team. How do you get people to to realize that there's a lot of misdirected anger, right? That's kind of the, the tough part about this, is how do you get people to realize that it's misdirected anger? Uh, education is one of them. I mean, people like, like teaching them about people like Will Campbell would be one of them. Uh, learning, I mean... Really, Will Campbell and uh, MLK, the similarities were the economic impacts. They were both anti-capitalists. And one of the reasons why MLK was assassinated was because he spoke out against American capitalism and against American militarism and usually basically said that uh, there's it's a three-pronged attack in America. It's militarism, capitalism, and racism and all three of them fit into each other one can't none of these things can exist without the other and will campbell saw the same thing now i, I, I before i go to this next part i know we, we've been talking for quite some time and there are quite a few com uh, comments so i do want to uh to respond to them. Chris Hedges is great. Holly says Chris Hedges. I do I do love Chris Hedges. Um it is uh he he is he is great, but uh he, he's not the most hopeful person, I will say that. I, I always kind of I always kind of warn people when they read Hedges. Um you cannot join the military if you're a member of the KKK. Is that true? I did not uh I'll have to look into that, Terry. Thank you for uh, putting that comment down. I did not know that. 
Uh, Republicans were started with Antifa activities. That's eye opening. Yeah, William McKinley is the one that shifted the direction of making them more corporate centric, uh, more capitalist centric because he wanted to win. And the Republicans were losing steam because as much as they did have Antifa activities, they were also um, purists. So the Republicans like hated fornication. They weren't a big fan of drinking and swearing. Right. And like at the time, this is 1890s. Right. At that time, uh, there were a lot of Irish and German immigrants who were a little bit more free and to the left. And the Democratic Party, which, as Holly points out, uh, were originally racist and uh, more pro uh, industry. They were more pro business. They were they were in for all intents and purposes kind of cool with slavery. Because it meant that the businesses that were funding the party would essentially be doing better. Um, but McKinley was really responsible for the major shift in the in the Republican Party back in 1898 by siding with corporations and then taking, you know, and, and that was kind of the, the slippery slope that led the Republicans to be what we know the Republicans to be today. Uh, Dermot Franklin also says, I remember that the parties. Party wings switched sides, but did not imagine either would put their bodies in the line for justice. Uh, shame about what happened to them, but I'm honestly impressed. Yeah, there were also, um, if I remember the number correctly, eight black Republican Congress people uh, in the 1870s. I mean, maybe 10 years after uh, the Civil War. You had eight, and they were all from the South, by the way. Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, that sort of stuff, right? Uh, and the reason why they sided with the Republican Party was because of Lincoln, because Lincoln was was championing for you know abolition of slavery and 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 so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, so so the party has come an incredibly long way, and they've made a total one hundred and eighty in terms of how, what they believed in and and how they uh, decided that. I mean, Lincoln was Lincoln was a pro Marxist for for all intents and purposes. He was reading Marx. He was talking about how labor was the key, you know, like economic impacts of of uh, of controlling labor will will determine, you know, the future of the country and things of that sort. Like he was he was talking about Marxist uh, ideology and that dude was a Republican. So how far we've come. Right. It's gone. To, it, the Republican Party has become a regressive party, whereas at least the one thing I will say about the Democrats is they have stayed consistently pro business. They have stayed consistently pro industry. The thing that has changed about them is that they've hidden it in the language, in the way that they say things, in the platitudes they put out there. That's where the Democratic Party has 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 shifted itself to. But they were always a pro business party. That was from the very beginning. Darren Franklin just sent you some cash for a coffee and tofu substitute donut, Chris. Thanks for what you do. Thank you. That's very kind of you. I really appreciate that. Uh Jay Jackson, uh, and yet there's a large number of white extre extremists, including members of the KKK, with military experience. Yes, uh, and that is true. The um, Boogaloo Boys, for example, the ones that do become violent are often veterans. Um, and that's part of the same thing is it's economic uh, disillusionment. And again, there's a fork in the road when you lead to that point, right? Uh, I think, and and this this might be specifically for poor white people or white people that have been in the military, because that was their only economic option. I know plenty of people that joined the military, uh, and they're veterans, and now they believe in like lefty libertarian or socialist ideologies. And I also know a lot of vets that believe in you know right wing, very racist, very isolationist ideologies from being in the military. But the reason why they join the military when I do get an opportunity to talk to these folks is I joined the military because I'm from a small town. There was one factory for me to work in and I didn't want to fucking die there. And I wanted to see the world and the military said that it would fucking help me get out of the shit podunk town. Or, you know, I was going to be stuck working in the family business and the family business wasn't something I was interested in. And the only way I could get out and 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 explore the world was and then they come back. Right. And they go, well, I served this country. I saw active combat. I injured my body. I injured my mind. And the government is not helping me. I wonder why. And they go, well, it's the immigrants. That's why. 
if it wasn't for these immigrants, we'd be able to help you out. But they're coming in here and they're just taking all their, you know, we have PTSD medication and there is a Mexican right now just snorting rails off of a job that you could have of your PTSD. And this is the lie that they're fucking, you know, sold to. And because they're in a state of emotional duress, it's easy for them to be led down this way led down into the into the narrative of the lies because there is no uh, oppositional viewpoint that's being offered to them that they can consider and not to mention uh there's a lack of critical thinking in american society our education system um the education system doesn't teach critical thinking i've had plenty of teachers that have helped me think critically uh so um you know, that's that that is something to consider, too, because you're right. They do have military experience, but they have military experience because they've served in the military, come back and they get disillusioned with the system. A lot of the Boogaloo boys and a lot of the the uh, right wing extremists that do have military ex uh, experience are also anti-government. So it becomes this kind of like. I don't even know what to, like it's this fucking mishmash of. You know, it's like the Tex-Mex Asian fusion ideology. It's just a bunch of shit put together in a bowl where they're like, yeah, we're anti-government, but we're also anti-immigrant and we hate black people and we hate brown people, but we hate the government and we want our gut. And it's like, where, what is happening with all of these? I, where are these coming from? I'm so confused as to what you believe and how your brain operates. But if you boil it all down, it all starts with economic abandonment. Um, you know, it's this economic hardship that they go through. There's a major economic impact that happened to them. Uh, Holly says economic justice. Uh, Malcolm always talked about how black, uh, about black owned enterprises. MLK worked, uh, spoke to striking sanitation workers in Memphis. Yeah. Uh, both of them were, were socialists. They just had a different view on how to liberate, uh, minorities in this country. The black Panthers, same thing. You know, uh, what's funny about w Will Campbell, and this this also speaks to the racism that you see. This this speaks, I guess, more to the systemic racism that you see. Will Campbell was doing virtually the exact same thing that Fred Hampton was doing. He crossed racial boundaries and he was talking about the economic impacts that the black community and the white community, poor white community faces and pointing out how almost eerily similar they were. Fred Hampton gets assassinated for doing that. Uh, Will Campbell just gets canceled. You know, uh, he he's not going to be invited to speak. This is, I mean, this is years ago, but you know, he wasn't going to be invited to fucking speak at uh, at any more colleges going forward. That 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 would be for damn sure. Uh, Jay, you and I will forever disagree on this point. <laughs> It's not the responsibility of marginalized people to undo the miseducation of radicalized white folks, especially if our safety is at stake. Uh, I don't think it's a requirement, but it helps. Um, I, I will say that the time I've taken to talk to folks that have threatened to kill me on the road instead of instead of trying to kick them out of the venue you know, pending that they're not trying to punch me in the face, running up and punching me in the face. I usually find something in common with them. Um, or they enlighten me with a perspective I hadn't considered and vice versa. I don't see it as a responsibility. I see it as this is the way that we're going to get rid of racism. This is the way that we're going to get rid of unjustified extreme hate that leads to these sort of things. I don't want to see a repeat of what happened on January 6th. So to understand why that happened to me is far more critical. And yes, your safety is that. But that's why Daryl Davis had a bodyguard with him when he met the, the Grand Dragon from the Klan. My point is, if if there were more people that even thought a fraction like Daryl Davis or or any of these ideologies that I'm putting forward, um, we might we might see less racial hatred. Uh, you know, I mean, this guy was able to to talk to this guy, and yeah, it took him about ten years. But imagine if that Grand Dragon had met with you and me, uh, and and comedian Mark Viola and a few other black folks, and within a matter of I don't know six months instead of six years, he gave up that robe. 
because he saw more perspectives. He was able to understand more and realize, oh, shit, the immigrant community is facing the same economic challenges that I'm facing. The reason why my people are losing their jobs is because these people are so desperate that they'll take anything to take care of their family. Well, it seems like we're on the same side. It seems like it's the corporations uh, that are that are taking a lot more of money that we've earned through work. Uh, so that's that's the perspective that I'm coming at here. Uh, and it's not to say that there's people that are b beyond the scope of reach, right? There's going to be people that are extreme on both ends. Um, and those are people that are going to be tougher to reach. There's people that are never going to fucking take that olive branch. Like I said, it's a two-way street. I can offer you the olive branch, but if you don't take it, then you know, you're know you doing yourself as much of a disservice as you're doing me, as you're doing the, the idea of peace. Um this is technically it's true that KKK members are banned from the army, but uh, the army screening process for that really sucks. Yeah, I was going to say uh, it's it's interesting because the National Guard had a bunch of people they had to send home because they had connections to white supremacy groups like the KKK. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so the, the rule might be the rule might exist, but the enforcement of the rule is what's in question. Uh, Mark Viola, J, J, Christian's whole stick is a marginalized person attempt to uh, undo the miseducation of radicalized wh white folks and dick jokes. That's a, a, a very good description of my uh, entire career, Mark. <laughs> I appreciate that comment. Uh, let me move over to Rockfin real quick. Uh, see where we're, where we're at. Do, 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 do. Where do we land? Great historical context. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. Uh, Zuzubik says 60% was in bankrupt. Financial distress describes 90% of the country at this point. That's fair. I would say that's a lot. Uh, that's a lot of people uh, that are that are in financial duress. Poverty in America is one long emergency, chronic torture that's used by social predators, the wealthy to brainwash and divide the masses into turning on one another. Yeah, I think I think using um, economics, especially when you have an economic downturn that it affects so many people, it's easy to manipulate them to say, well, look, it's the other that's the problem. Um, you know, so the wealthy invaded and overthrew the government a long time ago. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a super long time that that's that's been the case. Uh, Pelosi and McConnell denied Trump's request the day before 116 for more protection on the Capitol. Not sure if he asked for more police uh, or National Guard or both. I'm not sure. Uh, they both said no. They'll never investigate that. Uh, OK, yeah, I, I, I'd have to uh, I'd have to to look into that a little bit more. Um, the Tex-Mex, I'm glad you like the Tex-Mex ideology, Sarah. Uh, cool. I'm going to keep, okay, let's keep going on this. Uh, so looking at the deeper thing, um, what I've noticed from liberals and what Chris Hedges points, points out in this article too, is that the liberals are fine with canceling racists on the on just the behest that they're racist, right? On the surface level that they're racist. And some of them, yeah, you know, uh, it's it's like, when celebrities get canceled, like what happened to Gina Carraro, it's like, yeah, well, you got canceled because you you don't know how to express opinions properly. And the only way like you're expressing opinions to get, you know, vitriolic attention because it makes you go viral. And you're like, see, look at the retweet. It's, it's all for the fucking metrics for your shitty belief system. Like you have a shitty belief system. Uh, just because you're conservative and, and you can't openly say the N-word doesn't mean you can compare yourself to an entire group of people uh, that were murdered effectively. Okay, you're not going to get work anymore. The question of trying to figure out where this person thought that was a good idea, you could ask Gina Carraro that and she'll probably laugh in your face because she's not somebody that wants to accept that olive branch of trying to figure shit out. But again, looking at the deeper economic impact of things, the w what I've seen is liberals don't particularly care of looking at the deeper economic things because a lot of liberals, this isn't every liberal, but uh, from, from what I've seen, like blue check liberals and so on and so forth, they're the ones that are pro-capitalist though. And you can kind of see it in um, in Prop 22, what happened in Prop 22, right? The economic factors get ignored because liberals are capitalists. But the the 
hypocrisy in that is that capital capitalism is an economic system that thrives on inequality. It thrives on slavery. It thrives on, uh, you know, uh, money moving to the to to the few at the top while leaving those at the bottom to essentially fend for themselves and fight each other for the scraps that are thrown down from the top. That is how capitalism operates. And liberals do believe in that kind of thing. So they'll ne so the reason why they don't want to look deeper into that economic impact is partly because of that, because partly because they're going to have to let go of this economic system that has helped them thrive uh, as well, being that they are uh, rich liberals. Um, and, and, you know, and you kind of see that you kind of see the hypocrisy. Oh, racism is bad. Well, yes, racism is bad. But why is it bad? Why do these people believe what they believe in? And, and that question is never really asked, because if that question is really asked and we start investigating the problems within capitalism, they're going to lose a lot of convenient uh, convenience in their lives. And pr what what happened with Prop 22 is that the, yeah, Prop 22 in California is is basically a, a, a glaring example of that. Uh, Prop 22 basically says that no person that works within the gig economy for Lyft, Instacart, Uber, uh, DoorDash, uh, so on and so forth, are actually employees. They can never be considered employees. They are going to be independent contractors, and they are responsible for their own shit. And because you know companies like Lyft and Uber, and they come out and they say, "Well, racism is bad," and if you're a racist, then we're we're not going to tolerate, uh, you, you know, your 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 actions and blah 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 and that, that sort of stuff. Liberals are like, "Well, yeah, we're going to support companies like that." Well, companies like that don't support the worker. They they have impacted the economics of the country by saying prop 22 needs to go forward they spent a shit ton of money in campaigning for uh yes on prop 22 and it passed and now uh lyft drivers uber drivers doordash instacart uh you name it are not considered employees they're gonna be paid uh less than minimum wage in a lot of circumstances uh because they have additional expenses that they have to pay out of pocket for. Uh, they don't get health insurance. They don't get paid sick leave. If they don't work, they don't get paid. So, you know, and uh, again, in in cases like this, where if, if you do meet an anti-masker, if you do meet somebody that is um, not going to wear a mask in your car and they assault you in some way, shape or form, because they're independent contractors, the company doesn't feel like it's liable for for those kinds of damages. That leads to you getting frustrated and disillusioned, and it can lead to extreme ideologies. But liberals are going to support ideologies like this, what, uh, Prop 22, not the extreme racist ones. But they support that kind of stuff. This is a glaring example of of how the economic e economy works under capitalism, where companies are able to buy out legislation. My my view, it, it, this is this is sort of the last little bit that I'll say here. Um, my view it, it, in in this is is if we're going to offer people redemption, if we're going to offer people an an opportunity to change and better themselves, which which I do believe is is a tenant of society, then we need to give them that opportunity, um, and I think when you cancel them or ignore their point of view and their perspective uh, or don't ask the questions of where, where, well, where is this belief system coming from? I don't think you're really offering them a, a chance to redeem themselves. Uh, it takes a lot for people to change what they believe in. Let's look at it this way. If we can agree that people go and join these you know, extreme groups like the KKK, um, and 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 the what whatever it is, the Proud Boys, so on and so forth. That comes from misdirected anger due to economic impacts. If we can agree on that, think of how old the KKK is. We're going back to the 1800s here, right? That that manipulation of anger and hatred is so old. I mean, we're, we're talking about a 200-year-old tactic that is still in play today because no one's bothered to 
to push back against on a, on a large scale, push back against, um, you know, the creation of economic impacts, negative economic impacts. That's 200 years old through two, 300 years old. It's going to take a while for us to undo that kind of radicalization when it's that deep rooted in our society. I mean, one thing you could do is uproot the whole fucking thing and start over from scratch. That's a, that's a very difficult and potentially dangerous, uh, way of going about doing things. Um, but that's one way of doing things. The other way, uh, and this is a slower way of doing things probably, is doing what Daryl Davis is talking about. It's doing what Chris Hedges is talking about. Uh, is doing what I've been saying for a while. Is, yeah, talk to these people. I'm not saying go into a clan den and, uh, you know, by yourself or, so, or anything like that. Daryl Davis met him in a public spot. Found a hotel where both people have to check in, put their credit cards down, He's got an armed bodyguard. Clan guy's got an armed bodyguard. Okay, start there. There is j there is mutual distrust of each other, but eventually you can build trust. But it all comes down to, hey, we have more in common than than what you might believe. We have a more in common than what the system makes you think. I know it's controversial. I know uh, I've. Like Jay pointed out that we, we have a disagreement and Jay's one of one of my closest friends. And, you know, we I talk to Jay quite often and we've had discussions about this uh, uh, quite a bit. And people are going to disagree with it. But here's the thing. There's never been a moment of hatred between us over this topic. It is mutual disagreement to say I respect what you say and you respect what I say. That same level of mutual respect can also exist in this context where limits being drawn of saying that we have to get rid of an entire group of people. Obviously, that's something that nobody's going to stand for. But if they if if they say like, OK, I am still pro capitalist. Well, OK, I disagree with you. But at least you understand that this is where the problem is coming from cool like you can see some mutual ground anyway i feel like i'm 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 rehashing the argument <laughs> over and over again um i hope that that kind of helps a little bit thank you so much for checking out this video if you enjoyed this content uh please make sure that you hit the like button hit the share button and make sure you're subscribed to my channel whether it's on rockfin youtube or facebook especially facebook and youtube they often uncensor people, uh, un unsubscribe people, and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do, uh, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of, uh, of various shows that I, uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows the forkful of noodles live virtual comedy shows uh the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website but if you're also on financial stable ground you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member which gets you free tickets and bonus content and go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to to make any kind of financial contributions but if you can't it's not a necessity most of my stuff is available for free and for everybody to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H 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 -A, and I hope to see you at the next video.